It's the Cube, covering NAB 2017. Brought to you by HGST. Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with the Cube. We're at NAB 2017. It's not only 100,000, 102,000 people, according to the official press release, talking about media and entertainment and technology. The theme is actually met, because the technology is so intimately tied to media and entertainment that you can't separate them out anymore. And we're really excited for our next guest. He is right in the heart of it. He's in his happy place. <laughs> uh, he's leading the whole contingent here. It's Eric Weaver, he's the global director a media and entertainment market development for HGST. Eric, welcome. Oh, thank you so much, glad to be here today. So first impressions of the show, I'm sure you've been here a thousand times, it's yeah. crazy. No, it's, it's really amazing. Uh, it's always a wonderful show. There's so many great people here really trying to get an understanding of what's coming up, what's going to solve their problems that they're facing right now. And the problems keep getting bigger because people want more. I mean, it's amazing you walk around the, the level of gear and equipment, some of the green screen setups here, they look like professional studios. But now we've gone from you know, HD to 4K to 8K to Ultra HD. We've got 360 cameras, little commercial ones by, by like Samsung and professional grade ones. That's only going to increase the complexity of trying to manage all this stuff. Absolutely. Um, it's really becoming a reality now that 4K and UHD are coming down the pike. Uh, I think I heard some number that like 56% of all sets will be that by 2020. Um, and it's really great because you'll see the creative community starting to embrace HDR or UHD. Because they had never seen it before and until they go into the uh, color suites and see the difference, they're absolutely blown away. So you're going to have a drive here. You're going to have a drive between the directors saying, this is what I want and this is my look and the camera or the TV set saying, this is what we can produce and the right. theater's saying right. what we can produce. And we didn't even talk about VR or AI. Oh, well, and, right? and VR and AI are absolutely some of the hottest topics out there right now. Trying to comprehend, you're also seeing a big shift from 360 video um, to uh, photogrammetry and uh, computational photography in these things, volumetric capture, and those things are really going to be taking over in the next couple years and they're huge in understanding how they work for everyone. Okay, so you dropped a couple new vocabulary words. I have to have you dig into a little bit. <laughs> All right, so, so uh, photo, volumetric. Photogrammetric first? Uh, uh, photo, photogrammetry. 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 So what photogrammetry is, is recreating a room with photographs uh, by stitching them together. So for example, I worked on a piece called Wonder Buffalo, and in Wonder Buffalo, we basically took uh, 956 photographs of a room and then stitched them together uh, at 50 megapixels each and created this whole new room environment. You combine that with what's called um, uh, volumetric capture. So instead of uh, 12 to 24 cameras pointing out where you're stuck in a locked position, which is traditional 360 video, you're now doing 36 cameras in, and that 36 cameras creating an almost hologram. The big difference here is that now all of a sudden you feed it into a gaming engine like Unity and you can walk around and explore the entire scene. So it's the closest you've ever seen to the holodeck by like maybe Star Trek or something. Right, right. It's really quite an amazing experience. Now on the other side of the equation, on the simpler side, you know, you've got a lot of independent filmmakers now have YouTube and, and Vimeo and, and all these distribution platforms and you know, I'm a huge Casey Neistat fan, you know, he's got his little 2K, $2,000 camera and he's out shooting and getting tremendous views. So the, the focus on audience and storytelling yes. and kind of the democratization of distribution is another huge trend. Absolutely, really big. YouTube is, it's, what's fascinating about something like YouTube is YouTube wasn't possible a couple years ago. Something like the cloud made YouTube possible. If you historically look back, you'll see something like an electricity as the juxtaposition. And until Niagara Falls was there, we didn't have uh, the ability to have electricity on such volumes. And so some of the breakthrough cases might have been like um, Alcoa, who produced aluminum. They were burning or tearing down whole forests to put together furnaces that could burn hot enough to make it. Now that they had cost-effective aluminum, or electricity, they could do this. The same situation was like someone like YouTube. They can scale at a level that we've never seen before right. and was never possible. So it opens up whole new opportunities of democratization of the video. Absolutely right. amazing new tools. And, and then obviously cloud, right? Cloud, cloud. is changing the world. Um, the big cloud providers like, like Amazon and Google and, and Microsoft and a ton of second tier service providers. But the knock kind of on the cloud for big assets is speed of light's too damn slow, right? Getting stuff up and down is a pain. And also, you know, that's where you really wanted a big machine with local horsepower. 
That's so, it, but, but now you got rendering, you got all this huge stuff that you need massive scale that your little machine can't do anymore. So a, a big confusion a lot of people have in cloud is they think about taking their concurrent data center and lifting and shifting it to the cloud. That doesn't work. You have to re-imagine how the whole structure works. What do you put up there? Why do you put it up there? Are you using a proxy? Are you using some kind of hybrid workflow to maximize benefit? Because if you're just dumping something up there and expecting to bounce it back and forth, you're right. Speed of light and other things are going to kill you. Right, right. Um, there's other ways out there to begin to leverage that. Uh, principles such as IOA, inner-oriented connected architectures. Uh, so placing uh, your storage or your centralized data lake at an Equinix or some kind of colo facility where you can centrally leverage it and then working off proxies. Uh, most people don't know that when you're working in your color suite, almost all the time you're still working off proxies because you cannot see all those bits or we cannot get all the bits to the monitors right, right. that we have. <laughs> so learning how to create the proper workflows there is absolutely critical and it will save you a fortune if you know what you're doing right. or go to the right people to show you how to do that properly. So it's really use the best, the best attributes of both as much yes. as you can. You have to figure out how to use the best attributes of both. Um, so the other kind of knock on too much tech in this business is sometimes the storytelling gets lost. And I know I have a personal pet peeve on a lot of these big, huge cinematic explosions that <laughs> because still have a story. Yes. So, yes. you know, I think that, you know having a narrative is still so so important. Is, is is that lost? Is that enhanced? How do you see that integrating with the tech? So I, I think it's absolutely critical. I saw Spielberg up speaking at USCA a little while back and he's like, story, story, story. Tech is simply there to empower the story. And if you lose sight of that, you're absolutely lost. It really is the truth. So for example, I have two shorts out right now and one's at Tribeca, one's at South by Southwest, but we focused on the story. Although it's an R&D research project, you have to have a story. Right, right. That's the only way to move this thing forward. And if you don't have that, Everything else is lost. Right. Now the other great thing that's happened with cloud and cheaper storage and, and all these advanced uh, infrastructure components is now you can keep everything. Yes. Right? You, 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 data is no longer a liability that is expensive to, to hold and manage and you got to figure out what you're going to throw away because it's too expensive. Now people finally understand it is an asset. Yeah. Uh, so it opens up all types of opportunities to store it and do things with it. And you're seeing a lot of this shift from tape to object and other things like that because they want to monetize this content. There's so many new mechanisms to monetize content between the Netflix and the other distributors, Amazon and everyone else, that they are realizing this is not just an asset for the closet that you might someday use or sell right. in some broad agreement to some secondary station in Europe or somewhere else. These are things that you can monetize on a regular basis. Uh, but that actually brings you to the next problem, is understanding what you have. Right, right. <laughs> um, people get very confused, they assume that there's one film. There's not one film, there's about 120 versions of a film that are, uh, that are released. Between the different versionings, such as culturally sensitive areas like uh, the Middle East, to different language titles, to different ad pieces or other inserted parts, there are a lot of different versions to right. a film. And so people don't always understand that. Well that, that's interesting, but the, the other kind of knock on, on film or video, traditionally, from a metadata point of view and a search and a consumption discovery point of view, is if I search for a picture and I find the one that I'm looking for, I immediately know that's the one that I want. But if I want to find Something the thing that's new. seven minutes in to an hour long video, how do I find it, how do I consume it, how do I share it? That's an age old problem with this media type. So, part of the problem there is that we have not broke down metadata tagging within each of these, these pictures and these pieces. This is coming. I actually helped with ABC build um, a tool that created X-Ray, like Amazon has, for production sites. So that you could scour and tag all these pieces and begin to say, this is an action scene with this character in it at this point in the movie. That is coming probably a year to a year and a half out, but all of those things will begin to evolve here very, very soon. Right, certainly a great application for AI. Yes, yeah. AI is power. absolutely hot as well, and this is what the uh, studios are trying to get their hands on right now. Right. People like Netflix have really pioneered some of this work, and it originally it was to understand how to find content, or what people like content white so they could begin to produce content that was relatable to their audience. They've now moved it into things like QCing, because they are the largest studio in the world at this point. 
over a thousand hours. Are they the largest studio yeah. in the world? Netflix is the largest studio <laughs> wow, in the world right now. I didn't now. know that. <laughs> <laughs> so they're doing over a thousand hours, I, I think a, um, a season at this point. Yes. Amazing. But the studios are really trying to, are really doing a, a lot of work to get their hands on some of this. And so there's a lot of really great high level private meetings going on that's bringing these industry leaders together. ETC is a wonder place to see that. Uh, and okay. talk about these innovations. So you're in the middle of it all, you've been doing this for a long time. What are some of your priorities for 2017? And what are some of the things that you, you know, that still just get you up in the morning right now that you're excited about? So, um, absolutely my priorities is going to be cloud. Over the last uh, uh, about year, 18 months, there's been a massive shift. Um, it was before it was all no, 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 and I actually heard this exact quote from somebody at one of the major studios. He said, it used to be no, 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 you better have a darn good reason to now Yes, 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 you better have a darn good reason not to right, be going to say there. no. Number one, very hot, very on board. Uh, the next one again is VRAR. Uh, understanding how VR and AR is going to begin to change our lives and produce things. I wasn't originally a big fan of that. I thought of it as kind of 3D. But then I went to um, USC's VRLA uh, meeting and there was over 600 students um, in this group. And every single school was represented, medical, architectural, uh, journalism. These students understand that this is going to touch everybody. I don't know if you've ever really got into genuine uh, good content. Uh, someone like a Noni de la Peña does stuff that touches on more towards journalistic. For example, she did a beating in San Diego. And they, it's a very terrible rendering, but it's the audio's good. And you see a man being beaten from the police. And people are calling out saying, stop, stop, stop and you've never felt it so emotionally in your life. This is like, bam, it hits you. The VR part of it, the or just because she had great it. content? The and VR just... part of it, in the context okay. of telling a story right. and what's going wrong, wrong with the story. This is going to affect us in a different way, and it might not just be the clip pieces for TV shows, but it's going to be touching us in a lot of different right, ways. Right, right. Very powerful stuff. Yeah, we, we talk a lot about the AR. I think the the, the AR piece from a from a commercial point of view is, is tremendous uh, too. It's absolutely a bigger market. Right. So what's really going to be biggest is mixed reality or MR. MR is going to come in and it's going to fade you between the two things. So uh, that is really where it's going to meet in the middle. And then how do you 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 just dis, uh, distinctly called out the differentiation between VR and 360. How yes. do you split those? So when you look at it, uh, if you're looking at 360 video, 360 video is a, uh, a camera rig that's stuck in one particular location. It's uh, got 12, 24, 36 cameras all pointing outward. And when you're watching that, you're stuck in a location. You're hostage in more of a traditional film way to what, uh, what within that 360 scope they want you to kind of be from one spot. When you look at volumetric capture, volumetric capture is, is the opposite. It allows you to walk around, choose your own point of view, be wherever you want to be within that scene. So it's where we're going to be going. It's going to be much more like uh, the holodeck from Star Trek. Right, right. Very amazing stuff. All right, well Eric, Thank you for uh, taking a few minutes. Congrats, I'm sure you're going to be busy, busy, busy for the next three days. So I am. Uh, <laughs> thanks for taking a few minutes with us on theCUBE. No problem. Thank All you right. so much. He's Eric right. Weaver, I'm Jeff Frick. You're watching theCUBE from NAB 2017. We'll be back after this short break. Thanks for watching.